Let us continue with the line by line explanation of the poem The World is Too Much with Us by William Wordsworth, prescribed for the students of BA Part 2 English Literature in Paper 1. Lines 8 to 9. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Lines 8 and 9 reveal the purpose of lines 5 through 7. That is, to describe what modern humans can no longer grasp. Their rhythm, broken by many caesuras, contrasts with the smooth, unbroken lines above and emphasizes the speaker's dejected emotional state. For this, refers to the description of the moonlit ocean. Everything refers to all the descriptions of nature that could have followed that first one, which the speaker chooses to omit in the interest of time and clarity. As an Italian sonnet, the poem has a limited number of lines and is supposed to present a pro clear problem in its first eight. The poem stays true to the Italian sonnet form. <coughs> it caps off the eighth line with a clear expression of the problem of the poem, which is, we are out of tune. It slightly subverts that form by once more specifying the problem at the beginning of line nine, thus delaying the sestet, means the final six lines. This non-conformity is inconsequential, that is, it does not mean anything. However, exactly what you might expect out of someone governed by inescapable societal norms. When the speaker says we are out of tune, he or she means that people no longer base their activity around nature. Artificial light, for example, allows people to get things done without the sun in the sky. In a sense, these material gains provide escape from the confines of the natural world. But in the speaker's opinion, that road only leads to another trap, that is, life in the city. Being out of tune points to a spiritual loss as well. In an earlier time, for example, a few thousand years ago, before pagan religions had been replaced across large swaths of the globe by Christianity, people may have drawn great meaning <coughs> from the changing of the tides and phrase, phases of the moon or from the behavior of delicate flowers. Modern life, says the speaker, has made it impossible or at least economically pointless to engage with nature on a spiritual level. The meter and punctuation in line 8 reflect the meaning of out of tune. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. There is an extra syllable here, giving the line 11 syllables instead of the 10 standard to pentameter. Additionally, the line contains what is arguably a pyrrhic, which, is, which means a foot of two unstressed syllables in its fourth foot, vr, followed by a definite trochi in its fifth, out of. My dear students, if there are words which are technical for you, please look up the meanings, although I have tried to give you the meanings of some of them. In this sense, the line itself is out of tune with iambic pentameter. The caesura, which separates for everything from the rest of the line, also breaks the line's rhythm. By emphasizing everything, it points to the infinite rhythm. By emphasizing everything, I'm sorry, it points to the infinite depth of the problem the speaker describes and gives the poem a mournful tone. As already mentioned, the poem breaks form by extending the end of the proposition beyond the end of the octave.
the first eight lines of the sonnet. It moves us not, concludes the expression of the poem's problem. It, which refers to everything in nature, no longer has the emotional effect on people that it once had. The word us, the poem's final use of the a collective pronoun, asks the reader to wonder from whom exactly the speaker refers to. Lines 1 through 4 make it pretty clear that the speaker is part of the we and unable to escape its habits of thought and behavior. Lines 5 through 7, however, whose ex descriptions are evidence of a deep attachment to nature, seem to separate the speaker from the crowd. Maybe because this question occurs to the speaker as well, he or she takes the opportunity to launch into the first person and maintains it for the rest of the poem. Lines 9 to 10 Great God, I would rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed outworn. Lines 9 and 10 initiate the Italian sonnet's turn with a sudden apostrophe. This apostrophe sets a tone that anticipates the speaker's attitude going forward. That apostrophe, Great God, with its monosyllables, rel relatively hard consonants, that is T and D, and emphatic alliteration, that is repetition of the letter G, interrupts the octave stream of thought and marks the change between the collective or group perspective, which uses first person plural pronouns, that is we, us, are, and the individual perspective, which uses first person singular pronouns, that is I, me, my. This apostrophe comments on the octave by expressing the speaker's horror or frustration or in any case some sort of emotion over the state of humankind's relationship with nature. At the same time, the apostrophe could be a comment on or introduction to the cestate, the final six lines of the sonnet form. <coughs> also, by invoking the singular Abrahamic God, the God of monotheistic religions or religions that worship a single deity, that is Christianity, Judaism and Islam. The speaker emphasizes the type of individualistic urban lifestyle described in the octave, one of hard faithful work that, in a sense, is exchanged for a spot in heaven. Immediately after doing so, however, the speaker makes another turn. Nobody ever said that the cestate could only have one. This time toward a completely different religious tradition that emphasized a much stronger connection to nature. The speaker would rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed outworn. This sounds an awful lot like the speaker is telling God that he or she would like to renounce, meaning give up Christianity, in favor of a tradition that would now be considered heretical, that is, that would completely go against the church. This is a desperate thing to do. Maybe the speaker, seeing nature as the one true source of spiritual life, has given up on pretending he or she has any allegiance to any other supposed higher power. Or maybe the speaker is so fed up with modern society that he or she welcomes any punishment that infidelity might deserve. The words, however, suggest a more ironic tone. The speaker either does not mean what he or she says or wishes that he or she didn't. By describing the longed-for tradition as outworn, the speaker admits to the uselessness of Greek paganism. The wish he or she seems to be saying is a pipe dream. 
it sounds nice but it is impossible to attain in this reading the apostrophe sounds more like shock the speaker seems to be asking him or herself are you being serious the word suckled also demeans the speaker suckled which refers to being nurtured on breast milk presents the speaker as a powerless infant it also suggests that our beliefs and behavior come from the culture we are raised in so uh, even as he or she indulges for a moment in imagining life among the pagans the speaker acknowledges that he or she too is the product of a culture and society whose influence is impossible to es- fully escape lines 11 12 so my eyes standing on this pleasant lea have glimpses that would make me less forlorn lines 11 and 12 include language that taken out of context might describe a perfectly pleasant scene in nature the speaker stands on a grassy field you lea looking out at a moonlit sea the poem's pessimistic context however modifies the meaning of the words much in the way that memories of the city plague the speaker's thoughts at first the idea of a pleasant lea which essentially is a meadow or field meadow means grassland might inspire calmness in the observer yet the pleasant grassy vantage point has at best a neutral effect were the speaker a pagan living in ancient greece this view might make the speaker less forlorn that is happier of course that is not the case so might i says the speaker implying that what he or she wishes for is impossible because he or she was not and could not have been suckled in a creed outworn in other words the speaker won't see anything that will make him of her feel better because the speaker can't escape the modern world in which he or she lives line 12 however in its unbroken iambic pentameter might suggest an emotional shift even the speaker is not willing to admit it have glimpses that would make me less forlorn <coughs> as in lines 5 6 and 7 the return to natural imagery relaxes the meter which goes from being heavily punctuated to being totally iambic and unencumbered in other words there are no caesuras or metrical substitutions here even as the speaker says that nothing can make him or her less forlorn the flow of the line seems to suggest that he or she is at least breathing a little more easily while standing in the grass and looking out at water for reasons other than its immediate meaning the choice of forlorn also suggests a stirring hopefulness in the speaker samuel taylor coleridge one of wordsworth's best friends and collaborators wrote a long poem called the rime of the ancient mariner which describes the fate of a rather unlucky ship captain after he shoots down an albatross more or less for sport many years later the captain tells his tale to a young man at a wedding and that man after hearing the story goes back home feeling forlorn and because of it both sadder and wiser <coughs> by using this keyword from a poem that was first published alongside his own work wordsworth identifies himself as part of a literary tradition one that quite seriously hoped to revise the english language as with the poems earlier hints of hopefulness like line 3 and lines 
through 7. The speaker does not further develop this one. Given that, another interpretation that might hold that the return to iambic pentameter and the allusion to the literary tradition of which Wordsworth was a part are merely automatically generated replicas of what has already been said. Lines 13-14 Having sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his unreaded horn. Lines 13 and 14 continue to describe what the speaker might spot were he or she not stuck in the modern world. Proteus and Triton refer to mythical Greek gods of the sea, part of that pagan creed the speaker mentions in line 10. These gods contrast with the singular god the speaker shouts out to in line 9. Both of these gods are also connected with nature suggesting a closer link between those ancient pagans and the natural world than exists in the speaker's day. The fact that the speaker can't see them thus reflects the poem's broader argument that human beings have grown too distant from nature. Note also how these gods have been stripped of their power. They belong to an outworn tradition which means that the religion built upon worshipping them is dead and gone. In the mind of the speaker, they exist only as shadows of themselves. The speaker is not necessarily saying that had he, he or she been raised in the Greek pagan tradition, he or she would literally see Proteus and Triton in the flesh, but that he or she would attribute the ocean sounds and movements to them. Even thousands of years ago, to see Proteus or Triton required imagination. The speaker, whose own powers have been laid waste, can hardly imagine what it would have been like to be a Greek pagan. The best he or she can do is recall the God's names. These final lines, these final lines also maintain the iambic pentameter that line 12 restored. Note that there is a slight, slight elision here as Proteus scans as two syllables into three. Proteus rather than Proteus have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreath, wreathed horn. In this way, the lines are traditional. They don't break any rules. In a poem riddled with broken rules, the return to a steady state might come as a relief. But given the discussion of outworn traditions and the invocation of hollow deities, the meter appears stilted, even defeated. The speaker no longer innovates, instead relying on predetermined forms, that is, iambic pentameter. In fact, the speaker forces the final line into iambic pentameter. Without the accent over the E, Readed would have just one syllable. With this, we end, we come to an end with the line by line uh, meaning of the poem, The World is Too Much with Us. So we'll stop here. In the next session, we will look at the analysis of the poem under different heads. Thank you.